you're a good God who provides all of our needs, Lord, and you take such good care of us, Lord. But more importantly, Lord, you are the one that shepherds us. You are the best shepherd, Lord. You are the one that shows us the way that we should walk, Lord. You are the one that teaches us to conform to your image, Lord. You're the one that set the bar for us, Lord. But not only did you set the bar high, Lord, but you gave us all of your power, your grace, and your strength that we may achieve it, Lord. And then your grace is there for our shortcomings. So I ask right now, Lord, that you just be with us in the sensitive topic, Lord, and that your voice may speak to us, Lord, because this is one of those topics that I know that you have something to say. I know it's different names for every single one of us here, Lord, but ultimately I know that it's your plan. So, Lord, I ask that you just uh, fill this upper room with your presence, Lord, that your, your voice may be heard. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people. In the session of our saints and martyrs, here's we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, by the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so um, we're starting a new series today, which is something that we're kind of excited about. Um, what I love about this series is, you know, we just did the series on the Orthodox Afterlife, which was great, but I have to admit that some of my favorite things to go through are just straight through the Bible, because I believe like the best book out there, even better than, you know, all of these other, you know, great authors and speakers and, you know, fathers and all of this is just good old God's word. And we're going to spend um, a period of time, and we don't know exactly how long, because um, it's going to be until we decide that we're done, um, going through Christ's parables. And I think that there's something super cool about that, because when you look through the gospel, Christ teaches in like a variety of different ways. If you look at one of his most famous ways that he taught was like the Sermon on the Mount, right? Where it was like very clear and direct teaching, principles, application, um, and in very clear statements. And he teaches us how to live. Uh, I mean, he taught about the, our relationship with God, how to treat each other. But at the same time, sometimes he spoke in direct instruction. And in other times, he spoke in parables. And the Gospels have over 30 parables. Um, we're not going to cover them all. But I think that there's a beautiful way in how God uses these parables to deliver his message. Um, and I believe that there's so much like depth to these parables and even with the parable that we're going to be covering today if you read it at a surface level it gives you a meaning if you dig into it it gives you a meaning if you start looking at the words that he's using it gives a different meaning and it's very rich and deep and i think um especially when i was kind of reading this i started to realize okay i think i get like the concept of these parables but i don't understand the depth in which that he was speaking to um, so that's an opportunity for us in this meeting that we're going to choose a couple parables and we're going to really kind of dive deep into them and today, I believe, when I was kind of looking, I'm using this book where it references a lot of the fathers, and, um, and this one is going to be using St. John Chrysostom. Um, I think it's a parable that caught my eye because I think it hits close to home. And I think that it's something that we all deal with. Some of us might deal with it more at a surface level. Other people might deal with it more at like a deep level because it's about a topic that's hard. It's just, it's just a hard topic, and it's the topic of forgiveness. Because I think that no matter who you are and where you are on your walk, um, forgiveness can be challenged. And I think even for a lot of us who feel that we've forgiven a lot, right, and we've looked past a lot, and we've reconciled with a lot of people, there's still aspects of our life where we still need to offer forgiveness. And um, the parable that we're gonna be talking about is in Matthew 18, and we're gonna get there. But, you know, Matthew 18, so this is not the first time Christ spoke on this topic. Um, a matter of fact, forgiveness is one of those topics that you're going to see addressed throughout the Bible many, many times. A matter of fact, um, a matter of fact, on his huge sermon, like one of his like you know keynote addresses on the Sermon on the Mount, um, it's something that he also he also brought up and he hit on some major points. Um, so on the Sermon on the Mount, he starts talking about prayer. And we all know, you know, the Our Father prayer, and he, he works through that. And in the Our Father prayer, you know, we all know that he hits so many different buckets in the Our Father prayer. And he, and he hits that point that we all know, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Think about that. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. So he almost puts like a cap on how much forgiveness we, we could be looking for. 
because he actually does it in a way where he's got all of us praying that same exact prayer. Like, forgive our debts as much as we forgive our debtors. And that's something that I know that we recite that prayer daily. So that's got to be something that's got to be convicting to us if we, if we carry something in our heart towards somebody. Because at that point, we're, asking, we're telling God that, hey, it's okay for you to hold back some forgiveness from me too. The same way that I'm holding back from, from these other people. Right? So he, he addresses that in, this, in, in the Our Father prayer. Right? So you finish the Our Father prayer, and then after he finishes all of that, the first thing, like right after the prayer, what does he circle back with? Christ circles back and it says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither with your, will your Father forgive your trespasses. So it's like he's got this whole Our Father prayer, and he's, he's hitting it off. Daily bread, your will, forgive our debts, you know, all of this stuff, right? Your kingdom come, thy will be done. And then he goes back. It's almost like he highlights it, and he says, but let's, let's just be clear about something when it comes to forgiveness, okay? If you do not forgive others, you will not be forgiven. He circles back, right? And then even with reading with this, it, it caught me off guard. Yeah, sorry, let me send something real quick. Sorry, it's kind of important. Uh, So he circles back into this. One of the things I started reading when I was preparing this meeting, um, when I was reading this book, there was something I never noticed before. And in the Our Father prayer, and when he circles back to talk about it, he switches the wording, right? So it's two different words in English because it was two different words in Greek. And, and I want you guys to focus on this. Every, and, and a good thing for us to remember when we're reading the Bible, every word matters. Like every single word matters. So many times I'll be reading something, this word, like there's a word switch or, you know, he was using one word and it switches to another word. And you're like, why is that? And when you kind of dive in, it's just, a, it's a reaffirmation that every word matters. See, in the prayer, in the Our Father says, you know, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Okay. That's actually, if you go to the or in the original, that's, that's what it says, right? Now, over time, we might've memorized it ourselves in a different way. Like, I've memorized it, forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, but that's not the original wording. The original wording was, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Okay? Um, and St. John Chrysostom clarifies this. He's all, debts are things that, that include any neglect in the way that we should treat each other. Any neglect in the way that we should treat each other. And I was trying to figure out, like, the English word for this, right? And I couldn't figure it out. Okay, but I, there's an Arabic word for this. And as whitewashed as I am, I'm gonna to try to say it without killing it, but do you guys know the word wagib? Like you have to do the wagib, and you try to define like what's the wagib? It's, yeah, it's like you do what you're supposed to do. Like it's just what you're supposed to do, right? So it's not like an actual sin against somebody, but it's like the sin of omission, right? Like there's something that we just, we're supposed to do towards somebody. And then you start thinking about that, you're like, that makes a lot of sense, because you know what that sounds like? It sounds like a debt, right? It's just something owed to that person because of who they are in the image of God, okay? Um, so it's a sin of omission, so it's, and, and I think that we've all had situations like that where we know, like, well, the right thing for me to do here is I really should be doing this, right? Um, and a lot of the times, we just, we just don't do it. Well, that's a debt, okay? And then trespasses, trespasses are different, right? Well, what does the word trespass sound like? Yes, trespassing on somebody's land. What that happens, and now you have physically overstepped your bounds with somebody. You have taken something that is theirs, right? It is an action against somebody. You step on their toes. See, because we said that debt is a sin of omission, right? Like you should have done something that you didn't. And trespassing is a sin of commission, where you did something that you should not have done, you know, and there, this is one of those times where like, you know, you read the Bible, 
And I always ask myself, does he really mean that, right? Because this is, this is, it's a high bar. It's a high bar. Does he really, really mean that? And I think that, honestly speaking, we have great reasons not to forgive people. Like we have people that have done stuff to us and it's so hurtful and we've buried it so deep and we're not wrathful with them, we're not trying to get revenge from them, but we by no means have forgiven them. There's still a little something in there where you know, we are hoping that bad things happen to them. And maybe it's just me, okay? <laughs> maybe it's just me. But, um, but we have to look really deep inside and say, have we actually freely forgiven them? Right? Because I believe that we, we carry around this burden, we believe that some people are even outside of forgiveness, right? And this is an area where we'll look to God and we say, you know what, God, I have this area of unforgiveness in my life. I just need you to cover that with grace. Like, we know how much grace you have, God. If you could just cover that with grace, that would be great because I'm miserably falling short here. So the parable is in Matthew 18, 21 through 35. I'm just going to read through it real quick. And then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And we had begun to settle accounts. One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Let me just put that in perspective. 10,000 talents. So we all know denarii, okay? And denarii, because we know there's a parable that a denarii, what's the day's wage back then? One denarii. Okay, so 6,000 denarii is one talent. So basically, um, one talent is 20 years worth of labor. Just to put this kind of like in perspective so we have like the right context. Okay, and this guy owed him 10,000 denarii. So, all right, one denarii is 20 years. So 10,000, you can just, you know, when you put it in the calculator and you get like the E sign at the end, like it's just, it's too big, too big. Um, but he was not able to pay his master. And his master commanded that he be sold and that his wife and children and all that he had for the payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down to him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him his debt. But that servant went out and found another of his servants who owed him 100 denarii. And he laid his hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So this servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into the prison that he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, and they were very grieved and came and told the master what had been done, then his master and he had called him and saying, you wicked servant, I forgave all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have the same compassion on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father will do to you, to each of you, uh, will, so my heavenly father also will do to, to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Man, that is heavy, right? When you start thinking about that. And I love St. Peter for this reason, because St. Peter brings up a topic, like, and I think it's a topic that hits close to every single one of us when St. Peter says, how much forgiveness is required? Like, how many times? And he even throws it out there, like, seven's like, like, like even seven? And St. Peter's thinking, like, seven's a big number. Like, how many times can the same guy do the same thing, and I'm just supposed to forgive him? And God bless him because he is saying exactly what every single one of us thinks all the time, right? He gets the blame. Everyone yells at St. Peter for being, a, like, a loud mouth, and, you know, he spurts out, like, you know, stupid questions and stupid answers and all of this other stuff. But I'll be honest with you, we can't do that because I, there's not a single question in this Bible or a single statement in this Bible that St. Peter has made that I myself have not answered when I'm in, I mean, I have not questioned or answered while I'm in prayer. Every single time. Think about it. How many times when you're praying with God and you're in the presence of God and you tell God, I can't keep doing this with him. 
I can't do, keep doing this with her. Like how many times are you expecting me to forgive this person? For us to get there again and again and again. We're all asking that same exact question, right? And then even with St. Peter seven times, many of us were saying, again, God? Really, you want me to offer forgiveness again for the same thing? How many times? And Christ responds 70 times seven. And obviously, he's not limiting it to 490, right? But he's just showing the multitude of forgiveness that his expectation is, okay? And then Christ gives this beautiful parable. And it's a parable that once you wrap your mind around it, like you can't, like you can't forget this parable. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about Christ teaching in parables is the illustrations that he uses are so strong that you won't forget them. And I think we can agree a 10,000 talent debt is something that's impossible to be repaid. It's impossible, right? Like we said, one talent is 20 years of labor. So, so for 10,000, 20 years, it's just, it's, it's impossible. There is zero way, a 0% chance that this man would ever be able to make this right. And there was only one suitable solution to this end. He needed to be sold. He was going to be sold. His family was going to be sold. Everything he had was going to be sold. That was the only way that this was going to end. There was no other foreseeable ending. But instead, he begged for more time. You have the servant, 10,000 talents, and he's begging for more time. You know, and then you look at it from the master's point of view. You have the servant who owes you all of this stuff, right? And he's begging for more time. Do you think the master ever thought in a million years that this servant was going to come up with 10,000 talents? Never. So then I look at the character of the master, okay? Because the master could have been like, yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you more time, right? Like, I'll give you more time knowing that he's never gonna be able to pay him back, but at least he still has him in his bondage, right? Like at least he's still on the hook for the 10,000 talents, you know? But instead, the character of the master, the loving kindness of the master, seeing this man, seeing that he's never gonna be able to forgive this debt, uh, never be able to repay this debt, never gonna be able to catch up, never be able to make him whole, right? He could have kept him in bondage, so he could have at least said that you still owe me. He had compassion on him, and he freely forgave him the entire debt. And this picture here that, that Christ is painting is the fact that God's love moved him to, to forgiveness. This is a picture of forgiveness, right? It was his love that he knew that our debt would never, ever be paid. But he was moved by compassion and completely forgave him freely. You know, and, and it was funny because I think about this when I, was, when I was preparing. And I think about the fact that, like, he could have just given him more time. But if he would have just given him more time, the slave would have never been free. He would have never been free of the guilt. He would have never been free of the shame. He never would have been free of any of that stuff that he was carrying around, knowing that he was indebted 10,000 talents. He would have never been made right, not in a million years. He would have carried that debt until the day that he died, and he would have lived in bondage. The situation was that impossible, and he would have never been good enough on his own merit. And this is such a beautiful picture. Like, a lot of the times we look at this, we say, this is a story of forgiveness. Guys, this is a story of the gospel. This is every essence, the good news. This is the perfect picture of the good news, right? And I will tell you so many times, we feel like we are so much in debt. We feel that we have so much we have to give. We feel that we have so much we have to make whole. We have to repay. And we think, God, just give me a little bit more time. Like my repentance is right around the corner. Just give me a little bit more time. You'll be pleased with what I offer you. Um, but the same way that this guy with his 10,000 talent debt, we will never ever be able to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. It's never, ever going to happen in a million years. We will never, ever be good enough to even chip away at the debt that's owed to us. There will never, ever be a time the situation, our situation, is impossible. He apologized and he begged. That's what this servant did. He apologized and he begged. And I'll be honest with you, that is exactly where we need to be. Because every one of us has a debt 
to God that only that it's, it's a debt that only he can he can pay only he can forgive right but we need to take this example here and we need to apologize and we need to beg because what I love about God is he was just saying God just give me more time if you just give me more time I will make you whole but then we have an Ephesians 3 20 God right Ephesians 3 20 now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all things and all that we ask or think according to the power of him who works in us. Like we have that sort of God where he fills that gap for us. So we just need to throw ourselves out there and we just need to, to tell God that, hey, look, I'm yours. I'm sorry, I screwed up, you know, but it's, he's the one who's full of love and compassion. So we have that servant, okay, the one who was forgiven the 10,000 silence. And then it later, there's another servant, and it refers to him in the gospel. There's a fellow servant, right? The fellow servant is a guy who owes that first servant 100 denarii. So by that means, we say, okay, cool, all right, so I think we got it. If 300, um, 300 denarii is about a, a year's, okay, so this is probably about four months' worth of work. That's, that's much more doable, okay? This is a debt that can definitely be forgiven. This guy was very forgivable, right? Or he was very able to repay that debt to the one that he owed. But then we have this story take a complete turn that like throws us totally sideways, right? So this original servant, you know, he was forgiven a huge debt. You would think that the amount that he was forgiven, this is a life-changing event for him, okay? There is no way that this guy could have walked around the same after that debt was forgiven. And he comes across somebody who owes him 100 denarii. And I'm going to tell you, nothing is meaningless in the Bible. Every single thing that's written here is way deeper than we, we give it value for. So the 10,000 10, talent debt, what does that symbolize? It's a debt that can't be paid. It's a debt in our best, <laughs> in 20 lifetimes, we'll never be able to repay it. It's inexcusable, and its punishment is death. That is our sin against God, 100%. It is our sin against God. Like, we all owed that 10,000 talents, okay? Now, this, this 100 denarii debt, what do you think it symbolizes? The 100 denarii debt symbolizes sin against another human being, okay? It's still a debt, it's still wrong, it still needs to be repaid, right? I call this servant on servant debt, okay? Like the 10,000 talent debt, that's servant on God debt. Can't be repaid, not in your lifetime, never in a million years, completely outside of our control, right? But the servant on servant debt, that's 100% doable. We can do that, right? And how do we repay those? We repay them with kindness and compassion. We repay with kindness and compassion. How do we forgive it? We forgive it like if we're in the position to forgive, we forgive it because we are grateful to a God who has forgiven us 10,000 talents. The second one can only come if you have that first one. It has to be in comparison to our original debt. Because like this guy here who was forgiven 10,000 talents, it's almost like that forgiveness didn't change him. And I think that if we look at it in the story, it blows your mind how this guy went so diehard over 100 denarii when he was forgiven such a big amount. So we know that this story isn't about denarii. This story was a beautiful picture that Christ painted out to us basically saying, if you feel God's forgiveness... If you really feel that you are indebted, 10,000 talents, and now it's gone and Christ wiped that slate clean, how? How do we treat our brothers like that? Where is the compassion? Where is the love? Where is the forgiveness? <clears throat> and it hits home because who was grieved in this parable? If you look at it, the other servants were grieved. All of the people watching right? Because they're looking at this guy and they say, wasn't this, wasn't this the guy that was just forgiven? Right? Like, shouldn't he have been so grateful with his master 
that he should have mimicked what he just experienced? Like it's the other servants that are grieved and they're kind of throwing their hands up and they're saying, I don't, I don't understand this, right? Like, and then I wonder, the guy who wasn't being forgiven for the 100 denarii, don't you think that he knew that this guy was just forgiven? Like they, it, what happened was so huge. I guarantee you all the servants knew. And how did it make the servant look? The original servant. It made him look very hypocritical. That's a popular word these days. Because what does the church get blamed for? I mean, God forgive me, but I would hate to think that any of us are hypocritical. We need to be people who are carrying around that same grace that we received from, other, from, from God himself. Right? One of the biggest issues in the church today is I feel that there's not a lot of us walking around like we're forgiven. And I think that after a time, we walk around like we almost kind of earned it a little bit. And that's not the case at all. We, we need to remember that, that we, are, we were forgiven outside of our merit, outside of anything that we might have been able to do, right? And the church should be the most forgiving place in a fallen world. But that's not what we're associated with. A lot of people associate the church with judgment, you know, and, and, I, and that breaks my heart. But there's this, there's this key, and I never picked up on this until I was reading the commentaries on this, but if you have it open in verse 28, the very beginning of verse 28. So it said, I'll start at 27. The master of all the servants who was moved with compassion released him and forgave him his debt. But in the beginning of 28, it said, but the servant went out. And St. John Chrysostom started writing about this idea of the servant went out. What do you think that means? The servant went out. That's not just a physical going out. See, because the servant left the master's house. You want to see bad stuff happening? Bad stuff happening is when we start leaving the master's house. Right? Because when we start leaving the master's house, then like in this servant, he forgot about the experience with the master. Right? He started forgetting about what happened to him. We see this a lot when you see people like, you know, even in our own lives, when we're not dialed into the church anymore. Okay, when we start forgetting the church, we start forgetting everything that God did for us. It wasn't real anymore. And, and may God forgive me, but I feel like after we start spending years and years and years in the church, we start forgetting who we were. We start getting very comfortable in who we think we are. And we start to become even full of ourselves. You know, even myself, I remember when I was like 19 and I first felt like that rush of forgiveness and the, and, and the weight off of my shoulders and like I just felt like I was like a new man. I felt like a sinner who was redeemed, right? And then over years, you start thinking, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing too bad, right? Like I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. I know so-and-so, so-and-so is doing this and that and then I don't, I don't do any of that stuff, right? But all of a sudden, we start getting a little bit, you know, too big for our britches. But the reality of it is, is like we should never leave our father's house because in our father's house, we will always remember who we are and where we came from. If there's ever anything even good that we see inside of us, we have to acknowledge by no means is it because of us, but it's something good that God himself put inside of us and we should thank him for that because he can remove that anytime he wants to as well. We can never forget that we are nothing other than indebted servants. And we will never be more than that on this side of eternity. And it doesn't talk about how much time it has been since the forgiveness of the 10,000 talents and when he ran into that servant who owed him 100. So there's a part of me where it's, yeah, it's verse 27, verse 28, but maybe some time had passed there. And maybe for us, that's a more realistic application of that, right? Like, as time went on, we started to forget, right? But to be honest with you, does it matter if it was one year or 10 years? Not at all. He lost the joy. He forgot about the forgiveness. He forgot about his undeserved freedom. He forgot about all the grace that he had received. And when that happens, then you fall right back into our old nature. We start fighting back into our, our, our old activities, our old ways of, of thought, everything. And in all of Christ's teaching, the one thing that you'll see from the very beginning of this Bible in Genesis to the very end of this Bible in Revelation is the fact that forgiveness is always 
God's will for us. I have not found one example in this entire Bible, cover to cover, where there was somebody withholding forgiveness and it was justified. It is a requirement to forgive and that will never change. And that is the most basic part of our new life as Christians. It's also the most challenging part. It's the entire reason that Christ came into the world and it's the good news and it's what he came to do. And it's something that I want us to always remember that this forgiveness is something that it was hard on him too. Christ himself, Romans 5a, that while we were sinners, he came and he died for us. Don't think by any means that that was an easy feat, even for Christ himself. There was a heavy price to be paid. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It was his blood that was shed. No easy feat, right? And we must forgive because he, we have been forgiven. Colossians 3.13, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. That whole bearing one another, one another part, it should sting a little bit because it's a reminder that forgiveness is not easy. You have to bear it. It's something heavy. And if anyone has complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So look into your life right now and see are there areas of life where you're withholding forgiveness? Because that's a very dangerous place to be. Holding a grudge, withholding forgiveness. One of the best examples I've ever heard, you guys probably heard it a thousand times, I probably said it a thousand times, is that like, you know, withholding forgiveness to somebody is like drinking poison and expecting it to kill the other person. That other person might not even know you're upset at them, but it's killing you on the inside. We need to go and we need to understand that forgiveness is actually not just for that other person, but it's also self-care. It's good for your soul. You, you, can't, you can't hold that stuff in. It's for our benefit as well because it could also cost us our own forgiveness. So here's something, and, and if, you, if you're a person who's great at this and, and you have no beef with anybody and there's nobody that you need to forgive and you got a clear conscience, hey, good for you, then I'm just gonna, I'm gonna rest on you, Matthew 5, 9, where it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So if you have nobody that you need to forgive, then you be a catalyst in someone else's forgiveness. Be a peacemaker, seek out conflict, help reconcile people, because that's what God needs, and they will be called sons of God. He went out, the servant went out. So I urge all of us, guys, we have no business going out. We need to stay in the church. We need to stay in God's presence. We need to stay in God's word. Because when we find ourselves in those places, we will realize it's very, very hard. Because his sacrifice will always be before us. And it will remind us of how much we, are, we should be indebted to him. But in that grace, it will, it will motivate us to, do other, uh, to forgive others. Because nothing good will ever come out from leaving God's house. We, like, we need to stay here. Everything we need is here. We always need to remember the sacrifice. We need to remember our forgiveness. We need to remember our old nature and what was forgiven from us, his love, his grace right in front of us. And if we can successfully do that, if we can successfully stay at the foot of the cross, then forgiveness will not be an issue for us. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. And and Lord, we thank you because we know that these words, Lord, are there for our benefit, Lord, and we know that it's something you've called us to, Lord. But not only is forgiveness hard, Lord, but it's also such a blessing. And it gives us so much peace, Lord, to free ourselves from the hatred that just dwells inside of us. For Lord, I ask that we are just so full of your love, your grace, and your mercy, Lord, that forgiveness just overflows. So, Lord, I ask that in this coming week, Lord, if there are people that you put on our hearts that we need to forgive, Lord, if there's people that we need to reconcile with, I ask, Lord, that you just set the steps in front of us, Lord, to kind of make that happen. Encourage us, motivate us, Lord, speak tender words to us, because, Lord, sometimes that's what we need from our Heavenly Father. So, Lord, I ask that you bless this meeting, Lord. I ask that, you, that your, your presence just continue to join us here, Lord, and that, and that we will learn from, from your deep parables, Lord, because there's so much to learn. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us, that you be with us in the next week, Lord, and that, you're, that we feel your hand guiding it, Lord, and that you carve out the time for us to spend with you in this coming week, Lord. Don't let your word be a Sunday activity. 
We ask in the session of all your saints and martyrs. Here's we pray with one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Lead us not to temptation, 